and we seem to have a full we almost have a full house um and we're about to come I in mean, it's seven o'clock so we're gonna go live um so good evening everybody students and our distinguished guest tonight um for everybody who's following on youtube you're welcome to join welcome to our to tonight's open lecture um, so we have what we have tonight, and on the big screen you're going to see on, you probably see on YouTube right now, is uh, a number of the students in class and three guests who have joined us this evening. Um, for all the students, um, I kindly ask, ask you to, you can keep the camera on or off, it's up to you, uh, but for, um, until it's time for you to, I mean, you can join the conversation, click your phones off to avoid the echo. Um, so let me begin by welcoming once again everyone to Research Seminar 2. This is a course in the MA in Learning and Teaching Processes in Second Languages at UPD Medellin, Colombia. Um, the objective of this class is to introduce our first year master students into what it means to do qualitative research and um, to help to give them some elements so they can write the research proposals. Um, all the conversations we have here are basically trying to introduce them into that, into qualitative inquiry, into um, writing, I mean, doing research, understanding that doing research is something that is not, uh, I mean, that it's, it's rigorous and sometimes it gets, it's difficult, but that is not impossible, it's not insurmountable and that teachers can and should do very good research because we need teachers to do research. We need teachers to think research. We need teachers to live research. Um, so before I introduce um, our lovely guests, I'm gonna introduce um, Professor Edison Castrillon Angel and Professor Zaidi Agudero Lopera who are uh, two recent graduates from our master's program and part of my research team at the Literacy and Second Languages Project. Um, they are my teaching assistants, meaning they are relearning some things they took in the research course uh, a, few, a, a little while ago. And at, I'm hoping that at some point, um, Edison and Zadie will be teaching this course. I mean, I, I don't wanna, I mean, I love teaching research, but uh, I also have other commitments and I think we have to have a sense of continuity. We have to have a sense of legacy, like somebody, I mean, I cannot be teaching this course forever. We want to have young, I mean, younger scholars, young, smart, rising scholars like Edison and Zadie also sharing their knowledge. And they'll be helping tonight. Also, they'll be keeping track of any questions that appear on the YouTube uh, live stream from people who are watching this. And they'll forward the questions to our guests. Um, Hold on, I just want to make sure that the uh, audio is working. Yeah, it should be working. Uh, so I mean, I was sure that some, there were some issues with the audio, but I want to check real quick. Um, let's see, let me just uh, do one final check before we start. Yes, and I can hear the mic. Yeah, okay, so we're good, okay. Uh, it's, some people are saying there's an issue with the audio. Um, Hopefully that won't be, a, I mean, it, it could be part of it. It's because, of, I mean, and we'll have to be patient that some, I mean, I think the time and the number of people might affect, hopefully that will be an issue with the recording. Um, that barking you hear at the, at, the back, at the back is Connor McLeod, uh, one of our two dogs. Um, he's just saying hi to everybody. Um, as far as the audio is concerned, I will worry because this is gonna be recorded and some people say they're not, they're, they're having trouble listening. Just before we start, uh, does any, is anybody else having trouble with the audio? Well, a few people have recorded, I just wanna make sure we're on the same page before. No, the audio is working well, bro. Okay, so yeah, 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 just be, just, uh, I mean, people who have, I mean, you might want, you might want to maybe come out, uh, leave and come back. I mean, and that, sometimes that helps in cases like this. Okay. Um, so we have everybody. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, before we start the conversation, I'm going to leave 
time to our three distinguished guests to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit, a little about who they are, uh, what they do, and why. And I mean, kind of start about why they why they do qualitative research. That would be a good question also for for the crowd. So we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So first, I'll introduce Dr. Kelly Demers. Then we'll have Dr. Um, Kate Strom, and then Dr. Gavin Weiser. They'll introduce and they'll share a little bit about them before we start the conversation. So, um, um, Kelly, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, I would love to go first. Okay, um, I'm Kelly Demers. I'm an associate professor at St. Anselm College in New Hampshire. Um, it's a small Catholic college, mostly all undergraduates. Um, I teach classes um, uh, preparing teachers to work with English language learners. I teach a multicultural perspectives course. Um, and I also have an arts background and I teach an integrated arts class to our elementary ed majors. Um, and my research has pr primarily focused on white teachers um, and um, how they negotiate race in the classroom, particularly elementary school teachers. I am a former elementary school teacher. I taught sixth grade for five years, uh, music for a year and fourth grade for a year. Um, I could spot a sixth grader from, you know, a hundred yards away. Those uh, still feel like my people. I, st I have sixth grade sense of humor. <laughs> um, um, and then I, uh, that's a hard question. Why I do qualitative research? Because my first response is I really don't want to do quantitative research. And I felt, um, and I'm a really social person and I love to talk to people. Um, and I really want to hear different perspectives um, on one particular event. Um, and I love that. Um, it, um, I mean, what, what, what is that? Oh, Rashomon was one of my favorite movies. So um, I it just, I realized when I saw that, that's it. That's what the kind of research I want to do. So that's, uh, that's my story in a nutshell. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, quick, uh, su quick suggestion. Uh, I would like to ask uh, everybody except our guests to turn off the cameras for the time being. And then when it's time to ask a question, because that, that, may, that may help a little bit with the audio. So again, with the exception of Kate, Gavin, um, Kelly, and myself, everybody, please turn your cameras off. For, I mean, okay. until, uh, yeah, they may, they don't know, the, the, the four of us will keep them on because I mean, I really want students to see the interaction, but everybody else, please turn your cameras off um, just to help just to support this. Uh, yeah, uh, and I was listening to Kelly, and uh, yeah, I think that's a good thing. Those are good, uh, those are a good way, I mean, a good reason to do qual. And I really think, I mean, I, I identify, resonate with uh, when you made the reference to Rashomon, because I mean, that brought me back to my days as a grad student. And we actually saw that when I took my research methods class, we talked about Rashomon and the Rashomon effect. Uh, and then, yeah, and then the whole, missing and feeling the other uh, days when you're a school teacher that I still remember that very fondly and I still you know, I still recall that um thank you so now we're going to give the turn to uh our next um presenter Dr. Kate Stroh to be here and um I uh I, I work at Cal State East Bay, California State University East Bay, which is in the East Bay of San Francisco, California. Um, it's about 20 minutes uh, south of Oakland. Um, so I'm a professor of educational leadership there, although my background is teacher education. Um, I got my PhD from Montclair State University um, and studied with Ana Maria Villegas um, in, in terms of issues of teacher preparation around multilingual learners. Um, Kelly and I actually work for the same project. We both work um, beyond our, uh, our, our professor positions, our faculty positions, uh, we both are researchers on the ICMEE project, International Consortium of Multilingual Excellence in Education. Um, and Kelly and I have some of the same theoretical interests as well, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so I use critical post-human perspectives to study teacher and learning in practice, and mostly with regard to multilingual learners or English language learners. Um, and I do that so that we can think differently about teaching and learning. So we tend to have very linear perspectives of how teachers learn and how they take that learning into the classroom and then how that learning results in um, student learning, right? And then of course the linear connection of the student learning to the test. And a lot of folks actually 
look at teacher learning and then try to connect it in a very linear way to the student outcomes, right, on the test. So there's lots and lots of, you know, very situated complex things that are happening in between the learning activity that the teachers engage in and then what the students um, put out on the tests. And so um, that actually relates very much to the reason that I do qualitative research. Um, so as I'm sure y'all have talked about, um, the type of research you do does correspond with the problems you're interested in but it, and the theories that you're interested in, but it's also a political stance. Um, and quantitative research is concerned with um, macro level patterns, right? To be able to generalize about ideas um, you know, to the general population. And so that actually results in, um, and I, I argue it results in inequities um, and it filters out the stories of folks who don't fit the norm, the power norm, right? The power group. So those tend to be folks who aren't European or white, middle-class or elite, male, cishet, um, Christian, so on and so forth, right? All those dominant identities. Um, so for me, it's really about studying situated phenomena, um, whereas quant research is really at the macro level. For me, I'm at the micro, micro level. Mm -hmm. In fact, my research is about micro interactions because if I want to look at the moment to moment negotiations where teachers are negotiating with their students and negotiating with particular ideas in a particular context that has historical and cultural and sociopolitical implications, and look at how all of that is coming together with the physical space, with the things that are happening in the school and the district. So all of that together, I really have to drill down and look very, very deeply at those micro moments. And so it doesn't do very much for me to be able to look at things across a really long you know, span of time or at that very macro level, um, because you reduce out the complexity. That's what tends to happen when you go up to the macro level. So I have to be down um, really in the very, very sort of micro piece. And the, the, the conceptual framework I'll talk to you about later is, you know, it very much drives that, but it's also, as I said, a political stance. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, I mean, there is, Owen, there is a lot to dissect and a lot to dissect from that, um, from that initial remark. And yeah, we, I mean, in the previous, in the previous class two weeks ago, we introduced the reasons why we do qualitative research and mm -hmm. always the idea of going deep, going more deeply in, the comprehension of social phenomena. We briefly introduced the notion of Rustin um, as that guiding concept that says, oh, we have to go deeper. And as you said, and, that, and I like what you said about the micro, the idea of going into the micro as opposed to the macro, right? Quant can do the macro because sometimes we need to understand the macro, but sometimes in the macro, there are things that fall to the cracks. And that's where qualitative research can come into play. And the whole idea that we need to go deeper into certain phenomena in order to, de to develop this broader, I mean, this much broader comprehension of what's going on. That there is a level of comprehension that we can get by, um, by sending a survey to a thousand people. And there is another level of comprehension that I can, sp when I can spend six weeks interviewing one person. And that they're, in, in, and that they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that they're not necessarily uh, polar polarizations or binary oppositions in many, I mean, so they're so complementary that there is something called mixed methods. Also, I mean, so obviously they can complement each other. Otherwise, the field of mixed methods research wouldn't even exist. And I think it's important to bring that awareness because, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think the three of us can agree, the four of us can agree that uh, one important thing is knowing, and that's why I asked you the question, because uh, I want the students to begin to, um, to listen to the reasons why we do this, the mm -hmm. reasons why we do qual. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what the reasons are. Oh, it's not. It's beyond that. I don't want to do quant or beyond statistics or beyond the mathematics, the arithmetic of, the, of it all. Uh, I'll stop here for a moment so I can give Gavin uh, the chance to introduce himself and tell us a little bit more about his own background as a researcher. So, Gavin, uh, we're all yours. Sure. So um, I'm an assistant professor at Illinois State in our ed leadership area. Uh, did my uh, PhD work in the cultural foundations of education. Uh, in South Carolina, um, and I, I teach in our ed leadership as well as our women and gender studies uh, program here at ISU. Uh, predominantly teach uh, our master students, and so I'm in uh, a good company with several master students. Um, and so teach courses around uh, college student administration and college culture, um, and uh, really interested in research. Um, that's 
uh, what I spent a lot of time thinking about. And so the why qual is uh, very something that I think a lot about. Uh, and I echo a lot of what Kate was saying about that it is a very political move. And while um, I may have been interested long ago because I didn't want to do stats, um, I fell in love with the human interaction. And so um, my work is largely around um, young adult activism uh, and studying activists through visual medium and art. Um, and so uh, spending a long time in a group with a bunch of activists creating collaborative art to explore uh, their emotions and affects related to activism and, and how those uh, micro, as Kate was saying, like micro interactions between bodies and spaces uh, show up in their agitation and activism. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a political move, uh, but it's also very intrinsic to the work I do. And so I'm a very um, this quarantine is probably the roughest because I love people, right? <laughs> and so I've been thinking about like, what does it mean to do the type of research that I do, uh, which is arts-based research in a situation like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's about uh, human interaction and, uh, and the interaction between human and space um, in research is what I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm I'm so I mean well first of all I I'm I'm so excited and then uh, when I bring people to talk and to share with the students I'm, I always feel like I'm a kid in a candy store um, because I mean I one of those people who really loves to read and study and do and just talk about qualitative research as opposed in versus the, the work I do as a literacy researcher um, and I like I want the students to appreciate the diversity of positions and positionalities that uh, Dr. Demers, Dr. Strom, and Dr. Weiser are bringing to the table. And not only the positionalities in terms of gender, posi uh, location, theory, in, and also the epistemological and ontological stances to the research. Uh, because that's the nice thing about qualitative, that you have, you can really broaden your horizons. Uh, and I'm also really grateful um, that um, Gavin, has brought, Gavin has brought that the issue of where we are right now. Um, because right now, and I can, I can openly say that the students, my right now the students are in a, in a moment that is a, there is a lot of flux, a lot of turmoil, um, and that somehow has affected their ability to write. And I think, and it, it's affected our ability to write. And mm -hmm. some of us do, do this, for, I mean, this is what we do for a living. And it has affected us, so I can only begin to imagine um, someone who's just beginning to write the research proposal, dealing with all this move to teaching remotely and then trying to mean. So, at, I mean, as we talk about conceptual frameworks, at some point we'll really revisit this of how we, how we as a research community can cope with this and we can mm -hmm. find ways to keep, because right now, and I can, I can, tell, I can say this, uh, some of my own advisees are dealing with that. One of my students had to change her entire proposal because uh, well, she cannot do field work because mm -hmm. the university is closed. Uh, so now she had to move into a meta analysis, and I had a and I had a very nice conversation with Katie about that a few days ago, asking for a second opinion. And um, our conversation really pushed me into that direction. So we all. It's, so it's important to all also take this moment for the students here and people on YouTube that. This is a this, I mean, this is a moment where even with qualitative researchers, we are struggling to figure out how to navigate this. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. It's okay if you're struggling. It's okay. And that's the, my, the, I mean, me as instructor of the class, I mean, that's the message to everyone. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling right now, it's okay. It's okay to struggle because these are not normal times. These are not typical circumstances. No, none of us was ready for this. And the struggle is a normal thing. It's just don't isolate yourselves. Just because we're in social distancing doesn't mean we should isolate ourselves in moments like this. Mm -hmm. That's my invitation um, to everybody watching this. If you're doing research right now, this is not the time to isolate. And if you start looking all over social media, what you're going to find is the opposite, that a lot of us have actually come together and in a matter of hours. I remember from the moment this whole thing started on so just on Facebook alone, uh, four, five, six 
groups kind of started one of those groups has ballooned into this super uh, 20,000 plus uh, person community because we all need answers. So, and it's okay to have questions and it's okay to struggle. And that's why we come together and we talk. And that's why I decided we have to have this webinar because we need to mm -hmm. talk. We need to have conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just gonna move after this exciting introduction. We're now we're gonna start the class. <laughs> so <to speak. laughs> no, now we're gonna now we're gonna get into class mode. Uh, so a little more context. Uh, two weeks ago, I we had the first conversations with the students about uh, writing the statement of the problem, um, the purpose, and the research question. Um, and that's where we're at. I mean, right now they're in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. So I would like to pick up, pick that up, uh, and before we go into the conceptual framework, and ask and pick your brains for a few minutes. We have enough time. Um, but tell tell the students a little bit about how that process that you engage in as you are thinking of the research question for your project. What is it that you do when you're trying to think of the research question? And, and whoever wants to jump in, it's, there is no turn, just jump in, I mean. Yeah, so um, I think um, for me, I, right now, um, I tend to think of the specific phenomena that I'm interested in. So what is it that I wanna study? And then what is it about that that I wanna study? Mm -hmm. um, some of it also is what, what do you want your research to do? right? Because you want your research to have some sort of material impact in the world and make the world a better place. And so it also can be about what your contribution is. Um, it can, it, it typically also um, is uh, influenced by your question, I'm um, sorry, by your, the, the dominant theoretical perspectives that you're bringing, and as well as your literature view. So mm -hmm. for example, when I was working on my dissertation, the first thing that I did was identify a problem of practice. So something that was a problem that came out of my everyday work. And then I took that problem and I researched about it to see like, okay, from my experience, this is what I'm seeing and this is what I'm experiencing. Now let me see what other people have said about that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, you, you do sort of a comprehensive overview to say, okay, in terms of this problem, yes, this is kind of what we know about it. And here's what we don't know. So then you start to identify the gap because you want your research also to be able to contribute something, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, often it's just, you know, a little tweak or something like that. So then typically you are identifying the problem and then you are figuring out what's your entry point into the problem. Because typically the problem is much more overarching than your question will be. So it's sort of like great to think about it like a funnel you know, so I'm, I'm drilling down in terms, so there's the overarching issue. And then here is, mm -hmm. you know, the piece about the research problem, you know, the specific angle that I'm going to go in, right? So maybe the overarching problem could be um, teachers learn these like really wonderful collaborative, interactive pedagogical methods in their teacher preparation programs, but they tend to revert back to lecture. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Right. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the overarching problem. And then maybe my in would be, I want to look and see what happens to first year teachers mm -hmm. um, who came from this specific inquiry based program. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's how you, you sort of narrow it down. Mm -hmm. And I want to echo just a little bit what Katie said, which I think for me, um, Katie said it so um, eloquently as if, and that for me, it's so messy. So for me, it's reading, 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 reading. Usually it's theory. Um, um, and then um, writing down really messy questions, trying to figure out, um, oh, did I, did I get that right? Reading more, um, sometimes starting an investigation, realizing my question isn't right, tweaking it again. Um, so for me personally, it's a, this iterative process, um, but I love what you said, Katie, about drilling down. It is uh, everything, I, I think this is true, this is, should be my motto, I should get it embroidered on a pillow, which is less is more. Like, it's about that with a question too. It's like, how do you get to that, to that um, narrowly focused, sleek, beautiful, 
um, you know, Mercedes-like quest designed question um, that's going to actually do something for the field. So that seems to be, for me, the work of um, doing this kind of research is how do I get to the essence, to the to that nugget about what I want to say? Because as you were talking about in your introduction, um, um, it's qualitative research is about this very intimate micro world, and and we can't think this big. Um, yeah. So yeah. So I think it's I, for me. I guess the word is complex. Two, two words: messy and complex. Um, yeah. 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 Well, and and let me say too, I didn't mean um to to imply that it's a linear process for sure no, i mean I a lot of that is, yeah a lot <laughs> of it is going back and forth and all of that it's definitely a very messy process yeah. um and that's one of the things i love about qualitative research so yeah. like you said kelly you can you know sometimes your question doesn't quite fit you can go back and you right. can massage it a little bit right. sometimes you collect data and you realize actually this is telling me something else that's not really about my question. So I yeah. can go back. I mean, that just happened in um, a project that we're doing for ICME. Mm -hmm. So, or something happened with the project where we couldn't ask the initial question that we wanted. So that's the really nice, flexible piece about qualitative research. Yeah, you have to be transparent about going back and mm -hmm. you know making sure the methods really reflects everything. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with a lot of that. For me, it's all about as, as Kelly was saying, just reading. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, reading and reading and reading and, and, and finding out kind of how I view the world um, and and how I want um, to alter uh, the world for hopefully the better, right? And mm -hmm. also acknowledging like research in general is a super dirty word, right? Um, it has been used to mask all sorts of atrocities throughout history. Um, and so really cognizant of my um, uh, embodiment of a colonizer um, and trying to work through that to ensure that my work does not reify inequity. Um, and so I engage in a lot of uh, participatory and collaborative research, um, kind of co-creating uh, questions uh, with my co-researchers. Um, uh, so that's something that I, I take up a lot, um, as well as kind of Kind of taking a, a pastiche approach to various different schools of thoughts and methods to create something new um, is fun for me. It's it's non-linear and not easy, um, um, but I think it's fun. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of thought right now around the 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 potentiality within failure in research um and what can come out of that and so uh, uh, informed by like jack halberstone's uh career of a failure we talk specifically about like failure being a very queer uh move and what does that look like when we think about qualitative research like mm -hmm. you know I, I was doing this massive uh research project with a bunch of my master's students for a class this semester as for that means like the first time they've ever done any research and had a conversation with them was like you might fail that doesn't mean you're going to fail the class, uh, but this project might fail, and that's okay. Um, and I mean, it's, it's about the process and learning and contributing and doing something uh, productive and positive uh, for your community. Mm -hmm. Well, that I mean that's yeah, and I I mean I I really like the um, the conversation and that, and it's important for students to realize that that putting together a, I mean even something as simple. And I say simple because it's supposed to be short, a statement of the problem. It's it's gonna be messy, and it's okay if it's messy. And I think that's one of the uh, lessons I'm trying to convey in the class. That just because it looks so pretty in the publication and the paper, I mean, and when you read the uh, <clears throat> the paper, you read, I mean, I remember the words of uh, one of my former. Um, friends from, from grad school, she talked about the seamlessness of every of it all. How the paper, the publication looks seamless. It looks beautiful uh, from top to bottom. And there is this linearity to the publication, to the thesis, to the dissertation. But that doesn't tell you the whole story. And mm -hmm. I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a course like this, in a research club, um, methods course, we have to talk about the backstory, the behind the scenes. I think that's what, because I mean, that's what helps demystify this and understand, oh, this is a process that is not linear and that you're going to have to go back and forth. And that just because you wrote one question today doesn't mean that that question is going to be the same question you're going to end up with 
when you are coming to the defense. Uh, no, the question will change. The question will morph. Um, so that brings it to the second to a follow up question is like, on average, when you're for, when you're putting together your ideas, like, how many versions of a research question can you come up with on that? Like, just like, I mean, how many versions can you come up with when you're doing your own research? Or like, or how long, or like to put it in other words, like how long would it take you to come to the point that, okay, this is the question I like. Like up several weeks, several months, years. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's something that um, I, you know, over time you develop a particular research agenda. And so, um, you know, I, I tend to find myself interested in specific phenomena. And so my questions tend to revolve around those types of things. I say them in lots and lots of different ways. And I think I've gotten a lot better about articulating that over time. Um, but in the beginning, I think it can take a really long time. Um, my, I, I teach uh, in a doctoral program um, in, at my school. And so I usually supervise three students a year. And we start having them think about the project that they would like to, um, uh, to study for their dissertation in their first year. And typically, my students aren't able to articulate a question um, you know, really in, like a, in a formal sense um, until the end of their second year. So I would say it probably takes two years from the time that you begin formulating the problem, reading the literature, um, and, and you'll go back and forth too, right? Those processes speak to each other. Um, and, uh, and so I, th I think it can take a long time because um, you know, I think those of us who are further along in our careers, um, you know, we have lots and lots of years of thinking about these things, right? Whereas when you're first getting into it, you know, you're learning to read the literature, you're doing all these things at the same time. Um, so that's why I think it just takes some time to percolate too, mm -hmm. like to, to really think about the literature because it's not just about reading it, right? It's about this literature as a whole, like what is the story that it tells, mm -hmm. right? And where are the gaps and how do those gaps relate to what I want to accomplish and the things that I care about and the social justice agenda that I have, mm -hmm. right? So those questions just take some time to, to figure out and, and take shape. All right, I'm gonna stop right now because uh, one of the students already um, asked for asked for the turn to um because she has a question. Uh, so Manuela, uh, the microphone is open. Uh, you can turn your if you have the you have um have a webcam, you can turn it on so we can see you and the floor the, the, the floor is yours. All right, hi. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, my question is related to what Katie was saying before uh, about how uh, she had to change like the questions regarding what she found on the field. So uh, my question, how can I not lose my purpose like Shabbat when changing the question? That was it. Do you understand my question? Yeah, you understand? Uh, yeah. So. So I think, you know, some of it is about phenomena, but some of it is also about the intentions of what you want to do in the world, right? So for example, in the project that I was talking about, um, we're really interested in what are the, what's the best way that we can teach multilingual learner kids, um, you know, emergent bilingual kids. Um, we're interested in linguistic justice. We're interested in, you know, um, making sure that teachers are able, you know, content area teachers who in the United States um, all now have multilingual learners in their classes, um, that they understand um, that you have to be able to simultaneously teach language and, uh, and content. And so, um, so our specific purpose here um, was to look at how do teachers who have taken this particular professional development intervention, um, how do they translate that learning into practice? Well, things happened at, with the school year where the teachers weren't able to finish the professional development program. And so we weren't able to ask that question. But what we did end up asking 
was how can we look at this teacher's practice, you know, in this multi-case study to say what is happening in classrooms of content teachers um, of multilingual learners who have multilingual learners in their class? Um, and how can we use these complex frameworks to be able to talk about practice in ways that aren't deficit based? Um, so, so we're able to sort of provide a picture of what's happening in classrooms where you have a lot of multilingual learners in content area classrooms, um, right? While still, still able to promote some of, at least some of the agenda that, that we're interested in. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, you know, sort of remembering what your values are, remembering what, you know, your theoretical, um, mm -hmm. uh, perspective and orientation is you know, what you want to contribute in the world. Um, and then be, and then some creativity, <laughs> being creative with it. Right. So I think Katie, like it just to add on to that is, so if your assumptions about your research remain the same, then your purse, your purpose really does remain the same. Um, and, and you're going to meet whatever goal that is. I don't love goals necessarily because things always turn out differently than you think they're going to. <laughs> so but I, having teachers not be able to finish professional development is an example of that. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so maintain, understanding what your assumptions are that are driving your research. Um, so, um, because those probably won't change. Um, Gavin? I, I don't have much more to add besides that. You know, I think, <laughs> you know, they said it so well, but I, you can lose yourself but I think if you are reflective on your purpose, your question can change and that's okay. Um, so I can't remember who said it earlier. Um, someone said something about less is more. I think it was Kelly on, a, on your embroidered imaginary pillow. I think often we also start with more research questions um, mm -hmm. as newer scholars than we can answer in one project. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, sometimes it's about going out and starting stuff and realizing this is too big of a question or these are too many questions and, and scaling it back is also really great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would like to add, I mean, because we've kind of talked a little bit about this in the previous class, um, that one of, one, of, one of the assignments they have to do in class, in, for this course, just to give context to all, our guests, is they have to write a, a positionality statement, which basically is want to become later the role of the researcher uh, when, they go the, when they do the methodology section. So it's kind of like, okay, answer the question, who are you? Mm. Uh, because I, for me, that question, it's a very difficult question to answer, but a lot of what we do and a lot of the, the sense of direction and the sense of structure that the proposal is gonna have in the end, it, it hinges on being able to answer that question and understand this who are you mm. as something that is intersectional in nature that is you're not just one thing you're not just a teacher you're not just a mom you're not just a husband or a wife i mean that that all of that all of that comes together mm -hmm. to create a you who's doing that research and who's kind of guiding the reasons why you are the person doing that particular research at this specific moment in time and not somebody else so I think I agree that if you, as long as you keep a sense, that sense of direction of who you are and why you want to do this, uh, the purpose will the purpose will morph, and the research question is always going to morph. Uh, it's going to mature. It's going to grow. It's going to it's going to change because sometimes you just mm -hmm. change the question entirely in the middle of it. Um, and but as long as you, I think, and I think that's important in when you do qualitative research that you stay true to yourself. If you stay true to yourself. Uh, a lot of the other things that you're going to be doing are, are going to fall into place, are going to fall, are really going to fall into place eventually. And I cannot, and as, as the uh, methods professor, I cannot promise the students that that's going to fall into place quickly or that it's going to fall into place at the end of the course or that it's going to fall into place at the end of the second semester course. No, it will fall into place. I cannot put a timeline to it because Sometimes when I do my own projects, uh, things fall into place six months after that, one year after that, after hours of hours and hours of conversations with my team, with the, my group of researchers. So, but things, but things do fall into place. And I think that's one of the messages we want to send to the students here and to, again, to the people who may be following this webinar. 
things do fall into place, but you mm-hmm. need to give it time. You need to give it time to mature. You gotta, you need to give time to those thoughts to grow because immediacy and instant gratification are two things that are basically anathema to doing research. I mean, <laughs> instant gratification is not, I mean, that's not the reason you do research because you're, you're not gonna find quick answers, first of all, because you're not gonna find a question quickly. <laughs> so you're gonna, you have to give it time to grow. You have to give it time to mature. You have to give it time to become something. Uh, but then in, in your interventions, you have already kind of moved us into the main object of today's discussion, which is uh, part of the proposal means there are two things we have to do. And tomorrow, um, we will be talking about the literature review. So we'll have three amazing guests joining us again um, Saturday morning. But tonight we're gonna start discussing this thing called a conceptual framework and helping students understand what it is because sometimes, and it's important for them to understand what a conceptual framework is and how and what it takes and what kind of like the step-by-step, if there's such a thing, but that kind of is the step-by-step of putting together conceptual frameworks. And, uh, we, and the students had the chance to read two incredible articles, one by um, Kelly, uh, actually published in Taboo, and they, um, that, that um, state of the art article that Kate and another, a couple of other authors, um, Cara Viesca and, other, and the other two <laughs> I forgot right now, um, they wrote. So, I want to throw that first question. What, how would you define what a, what a conceptual framework is? Um, I can start. Um, I mean, so a conceptual framework, really, for me, um, first, I want to say that um, the conceptual framework that's um, in the paper that I shared really was um, came to be because of the study. It came really as a result of an analysis. It came after um, I coded all the data and I had no idea how even to organize it or look at it. So the conceptual framework actually wasn't a result of the study. That isn't always the case. Sometimes the conceptual framework gets created before the, st- um, the study is done, but that did not occur for me. Um, but really the, it's composed of almost every aspect of the, the research process. It's, compo- it's created from the position- positionality of the researcher, um, the research questions, um, all of the theoretical work that you, you um, put into it. Um, for me, it came from the analysis and the themes. So everything that came together um, cr- helped c- to create this um, conceptual framework. So whereas theory, um, it really, theory is, um, you, you identify a theoretical framework before you start a particular um, research project and then you use that throughout the whole project. Um, I would say a conceptual framework is more iterative, it can take more time, um, and there isn't really one way to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, um, the conceptual framework, it's, it's the ideas um, that you need to be able to, um, so, to be able to do sort of what you wanna do with your project. Um, And so so for me, for example, like I really wanna think differently about about teaching and learning. And so when I first um, started thinking about teaching and learning, I was learning particular um, conceptual approaches, theoretical approaches in my program that didn't necessarily help me with the problem that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, It didn't provide the tools that I needed. And so, um, you know, I, I really needed something that could explain like how multiple elements are working together to produce teaching and learning. And so, um, so I kind of dabbled in like complexity theory and actor network theory, um, chat, uh, cultural historical activity theory. Um, but then when I came across rhizomatics, I was like, okay, these are the tools that I need. Um, and at first I tried to mash them up like rhizomatics and complexity theory, because I just wasn't comfortable with rhizomatics because it's, it's more of a philosophical approach. And I, I never really took any philosophy classes. The reading was really hard. Um, but over time I was able to like decide which concepts I needed, um, that would constitute the framework for me. So they were the tools that I needed to be able to, Mm -hmm. um, 
work with my data and to be able to um, create new ideas to put forward. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think for me, I think of a conceptual framework kind of like the scaffolding on a side of a building. Um, it's helpful for us to think about both the building and the cleaning of the building. Um, and it helps us throughout the process of the research, whether, and it sometimes is being built as the building is going, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I find that metaphor kind of useful for me as I think about how I engage and use conceptual frameworks that I borrow, I create. Um, um, so yeah, that's kind of how I use and then come to it. Well, I want to start picking up because I mean, there were a lot of interesting things right there. And I want us to start kind of taking some notes about this particular element. And the first element is this idea of how a lot of elements in the conceptual or theoretical framework seem to be very organic and you kind of are you kind of start kind of building them as you go mm -hmm. so that even if you have a proposal your conceptual framework is not going to be completely 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 set in casting stone um and that there is a moment and we use the expression shopping for theory um and that's an expression students might want to mm -hmm. heard before it's called shopping for theory i remember i i heard that expression when i was in grad school and it's like oh it sounds interesting. And I realized that that is something that scholars are always doing. So it's not, I thought at first it was, oh no, it's something that novice scholars do because they're just learning about theory. But then I realized, no, that's something we always do. That we always shop in for theory and that a lot of things, I mean, a lot of, a lot of times when you put together a framework, sometimes you just kind of stumble upon a concept. And that is not that uncommon that sometimes you're like, you're just doing something and somebody says, hey, you should, have you heard of this person? Uh, have you heard of this guy and his, or this person and their work? And you're like, no. And mm -hmm. then I go read that person and I find out, oh, this works. <laughs> or this fits my work. I mean, sometimes I have constructed conceptual frameworks kind of like tripping on me, kind of like almost tripping on a concept mm -hmm. because, I, because I just found that somebody told me to read a book and then I found the concept and that I go. And after I read it, that kind of fits within what I want to do. And that, that seems to be a very normal mm -hmm. thing. Because I mean, sometimes students think that they have to have the theory already figured out in order to proceed with the next level. When the reality of building conceptual framework says the opposite, that a lot of that, it's even trial and error. And, mm -hmm. are, and, are in how, and so one of the questions is how much trial and error um, have you experienced when you're building your own conceptual frameworks? Mm. A lot. <laughs> Sorry, it was what Connor just came to say hi after a long walk. So, <laughs> oh, cool. But right, go um, ahead, go ahead, Gavin. You were just started. You started with a lot. I want you. I want. I want you to continue with that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm still new um, ish to this side of uh, my my degree, um, and so I'd like to hope that I, I I won't have so much trial and error 10, 20 years from now. But who's to say, right? Um, and I think part of my trial and error comes back to kind of, kind of my research, my research questions right now about like, what does failure look like in qualitative research and how can that continue to be generative? Because there's so much trial and error, so much failure, and so much self-doubt amongst uh, scholars, um, and I don't know if it's true, um, so I'm going to say it anyway, maybe even more so along qualitative researchers because we've been like derided so much within the academy uh, for not doing real work, right? And so there's so much self-doubt amongst ourselves. And so hmm. there's all this trying something, seeing if it works, um, learning from others. Um, I, I like to think about research and art as kind of the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I forget who it was, someone said like, you know, a piece of art is, is never finished until you put it down. Mm -hmm. And it's similar with research right like i've written things that i go back now and i read them like holy shit what was that right <laughs> um and so for me it's it's completely all trial and error um and and hopefully you're batting you know a 500 and you're getting half as many rights as wrongs and that's a really great average in baseball 
I've been told I'm not a sports person, but someone told me that once. Mm -hmm. uh, so stick with that. Well, I, well, one thing I can tell you right now, I mean, 10 years after getting out of the PhD, is a lot of the trial and error still continues. Uh, I don't think that I don't think that really ends. I mean, I'm, th I'm still doing a lot of that. And again, mm -hmm. I'm 10 years. I'm 10 years out of. Oh my God, it's 10 years already. Can't believe. Well, it. and it goes back to kind of like my entire philosophy on life. Really, is that a day without learning is a day wasted, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, if you're not trying new things, you're not learning new things, um, and you just become routine and, and boring and non, not yeah, non-innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, and we live in a time where we need innovation uh, in many ways. Um, and if we're going to do the work, then, then we need to actually do the work and not just say that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, and, and it's important that that experimentation, I think, is an important element of putting together a conceptual framework. Now, here's the next issue, because I, 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 sometimes I think students fail. And this is what I've seen. I mean, if you have students, sometimes students seem to have a problem that there is always something missing that doesn't really show that they have a conceptual framework. And I see sometimes what happens is uh, student lists make, a, I mean, they start listing a, a, a number of concepts or a number of theories. One, two, three, they do the shopping list, if you will. Yeah. But then there is one element that is missing and it's actually the framework. It's how they, in, how they bring the concepts together. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's important for students to understand that a conceptual framework is not a shopping list of theories. Mm -hmm. You can list six, seven theories and list 20 authors and not have a conceptual framework. You just have six or seven authors, but they're not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key element. How? And I think that's that kind of goes into the next question um, for, for the three of you is, once you have all those ideas that you have found scattered, how do you, how do you, what is your mental process to kind of make them work together or talk to each other or coexist in order to have that thing we call a conceptual framework? Hmm. Um, I think in, for me, it was about how, how am I going to structure all of these concepts and ideas um, so that they can answer my research questions. Like, so I had to frame it in a way that, um, that made that possible. Um, and, um, and I think some of that is, cause it's, cause the conceptual framework is not just a set of theories. It's, it's also your epistemological choices. It's also, like I said before, your positionality. And that's kind of, I think for me, that was sort of the glue or, or the tissue um, and the connect, the connected tissue that kind of allowed me to put it together. Um, so that it had this organic process. I do want to go back just for a second to the trial and error part because I'm not sure if I experienced the, at least the framework, the racial geography of teaching framework that you guys read about um, for today as really a trial and error, so much as um, this organic realization that this is how it's supposed to go together. And I think again, it was because it was related to my questions. And then there, the other thing I want to add too is that it also, um, it's like um, what Gavin said about art per se and that it's not done. It's done until you put it down. I think even when every time I pick it up again, it has almost an organic life to itself that it's also um, to lose, use the Deleuzian sense, it's still becoming something <laughs> even, um, even um, every time I pick it up. It's, not, it's still not done. It, there's still other ways of answering the question. All right, before I give the room um, to get, get, um, Gavin, I, I want to pick on something you just said, Kelly. And it's that, and I want to just quote unquote, the organic realization. Can you, elab I mean, can you elaborate what that meant for you? When, I mean, when, you had, when, when was that moment when you had that? And I love that work. And I, and I hope my students are, or at least my TAs are taking note of that particular quote, organic realization. When do, when do you see that? What do you see that happen when you were uh, building your framework? Um, I actually think to go back to when it was, a, it, it allowed me to see um, how to answer the question. Like it allowed me to see that I had everything that I needed to answer these research questions for in this particular moment. Um, and so I think, I think that's that was the aha, aha moment. Um, 
I was, because I, I will tell you, I mean, this was 10 years ago, because I'm also 10 years out from doing my dissertation. And, <laughs> and I, I never thought I was going to be done. I thought I would be, you know, on my deathbed working on this dissertation. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and it was awful. I was weeping and gnashing my teeth and pulling my hair. And, and um, it was really about this, suddenly I had this shift. Um, um, and, and it didn't feel, like I said, it really didn't feel like trial and error. Maybe at an, another point in another project it will, but for, it just was the sort of push forward. It was um, to get me to that, to the answer. Mm. I don't know if I, now, now I'm gonna leave the room for um, Kate and Gavin, if you wanna add something or do you wanna continue the conversation? Yeah, I can add, and I just, I have to jump off at a, at a little after six, if that's okay. Well, my time. Yeah, 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 it's okay, okay. it's okay. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with what Kelly was saying. I don't know if I had a tri trial and error period. Maybe um, it, for me, it just, it was like, okay, this doesn't quite fit for what I want it to do. And then, oh, actually I'm missing something. So I first started, I shared, I was in complexity theory. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons, um, one of the big critiques that I had of the dominant teacher learning or teacher development research was that it was very linear. Um, it was very process product. And it looked at the teacher as an autonomous actor who had um, total agency, who, who did teaching, right, as a transaction to the, to the student. And so I was looking for something that would disrupt that mm -hmm. and would allow me to look at teaching as a collective phenomena. So complexity theory is all about systems. It's about adaptive systems. But it comes out of mathematics. And so it still has a very positivist language. Um, mm -hmm. And it does not it does not disrupt as much as I needed it to. And, and it didn't really give me any methodological tools either. One of the things about complexity theories, it's about simultaneous macro and micro, like decontextualization and contextualization. And I'm, so that you're not even supposed to really use it for like micro phenomena. So I was, de and it's not political either. So I was dealing with all of this stuff. And when I came across rhizomatics and it was one of these things where it was just like, ah, like I was sitting, I was sitting in an 8 a.m session at AERA, which I almost didn't go to. Um, my, my person I was um, staying with dragged me out of bed to go see Elizabeth St. Pierre and Patty Lather talking about rhizomatics. And so I'm listening to this and it's a theory of complexity that has critical components to it. And it's a theory of multiplicity. And I was like, this is what I need. And so I started reading it. So as I got further and further into it, I adapted particular concepts, but I didn't take everything. Um, and I was very strategic with it. One thing for me is for conceptual frameworks, especially if you're working um, with ideas that are really like outside the norm, which rhizomatics or critical post-humanism is, like it's a very different ontological framework. Most, um, a lot of the theories we work with in the Western world are based in rational humanism and anthropocentrism, which are the main ways that we think. It, this totally disrupts that. So for me, it's like, okay, I'm only going to present these couple of ideas because I can translate them very well. If I throw in everything, I'm going to be talking a different language. So anyway, so I, I had my few concepts. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And then I thought, this is a dissertation about teacher learning. And I don't have a theory of learning, you know, or, and a theory that, that um, informs what I think about good teaching. And so what I did then was I added a component around teaching for social justice. And so then I had to, you know, break that down and what are all the pieces of, so I almost had like two conceptual frameworks, but then I had to figure out how do these talk to each other? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been continuing to develop that connection over many, many years. Um, and people still push me on it, you know, because generally my pedagogical orientation comes out of, it's cr like a mashup of critical pedagogy and sociocultural theory those have some humanist orientations. And so the really the people who consider themselves really hardcore post-humanists are like, well, those are totally incompatible, blah, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. And so I've had to do things like go back and say, actually Vygotsky cited Spinoza. Spinoza is where like the Deleuzians and all that, they're neo Spinoza. So I have to like go back and trace some of these things um, to be able to actually articulate the connections between them. Um, and so, you know, and again, that comes with time. All right. Um, so, Gavin, do you have anything else? Or should I, because I want to make sure that we have some time um, for questions, and especially before Katie leaves yeah. us. So I'm going to, I mean, right now we're going to open the floor for questions. So if there are any, 
any of the students or uh, the TAs, they also have questions. Right now is a good time to start picking everybody's brains. This is a good time to raise any questions you have about the research proposal, research questions, conceptual framework. Take advantage of this time right now. I'm just gonna, I mean, after I finish the sentence, I'm gonna mute the, I'm gonna mute the microphone and the room is yours. So let's hear those questions. Once again, let's hear those questions. They're probably thinking right now. We're gonna give them a second. Wait that, time. time. Oh yeah, this is, the, <laughs> this is that moment where they're thinking and we're gonna see what brave soul is going to unmute the microphone and go with the question. Good evening. There you go. Hello. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask something more related to I, how, how do you filter that information? Like, when do you know that you need to stop like digging in the theory? Because sometimes, uh, I mean, when I'm reading some research projects, uh, in every conceptual reference, there's communicative competence. And, and there's, it's always there. And sometimes, I don't know like, to what extent we need to go beyond that or maybe some, concept, uh, some concepts are not that important. So maybe, I don't know if you can give us some tips about that, like how to filter, it would be great. Hmm. I can, I mean, I can offer a suggestion. Um, so I take a lot of um, my inspiration from Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari and how they talk about theory and ideas. And so what they say in terms of reading theory or reading anything really, but um, reading theory is you wanna read it like you watch TV, right? Which means that as you're watching TV, like you take only what you need. Mm -hmm. And so do the same thing with theory. What sticks with you after you read this, right? And take that and plug it into your work because for the purpose for you, right, is a conceptual framework is going to help you do something, right? So for you, it's not to know every single thing that ever was said about this theory and the entire genealogy of this theory. Um, it's, it's to develop a framework that will help you do something. So create a set of tools mm -hmm. that's going to help you approach the problem that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so I, you know, especially when you're in school, um, and working on these projects, you have to remember, this is not the last thing you're ever going to do. It's one of the first things that you're ever going to do. And so, so just remember that and be kind to yourself and know that you don't have to read everything there ever was just to the point where you're confident that you're finding some tools that you can put to work and then go put them to work. I mean, like we said, it's a nonlinear process. So you have to take those tools and experiment with them and then see if they do what you need them to do. If they provide new understandings, more complex, you know, readings, whatever it is that your intention is or what you're hoping. And maybe some things too that you didn't, you didn't know were going to happen, you know, but, but put it to work, see what it does and then judge, okay, do I need to go back and do some more readings or do I need a diff, you know, do I need this other concept? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I think it's following that iterative process. Mm -hmm. And then also not being afraid to um, take something that is so incredibly intriguing and interesting and putting it in a file and putting it away until after you're done with your, your thesis or your dissertation. It'll be there when you're done. Great, thanks. Well, I, I really wanna pick up uh, that one of the key words that Katie said, be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, we cannot stress that enough. Mm -hmm that um, th some of these things take time. And sometimes mm -hmm. one day everything falls into place and the next day you realize, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. And that you're always gonna be somewhere in the middle of that. But kindness to, our, kindness to ourselves is a very important element. I mean, I think Gavin's research about failure uh, definitely falls into mm -hmm. that, falls in line with that the need for kindness, for self-kindness, because sometimes mm -hmm. we can be uh, judged during execution. We can be reviewer too of our own work if we're not careful enough. So I really wanted to stress that, 
the sense of kindness as you are in the journey mm -hmm. of figuring this out. And for everybody, all the students, including Zadie and Edison, you just be, you're just getting started. Mm -hmm. So as you get started, don't get frustrated if things don't fall into place right away because mm -hmm. sometimes they don't. Um, just give yourselves the time to play with that, to read, to make sense of this. Uh, is there another question? Just jump in. I mean, don't don't be shy. I have a question. Good evening, everyone. Um, um, Kelly Dimmer said before that uh, uh, positionality is important. Uh, putting about uh, yourself in uh, your conceptual framework is important. How to keep it objective? Or is it okay to be subjective sometimes? That is my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I would say for myself, um, as a qualitative researcher, um, that I think it's th that subjectivity is what's going to happen and being transparent about that at all times. So what um, the work that was reported on the, in the article um, that you read for tonight was uh, around white teachers um, who are working in an elementary school. And I was a former white teacher who worked in an elementary school and I loved my participants. I thought they were spectacular, great teachers. Um, and so I did have to, um, uh, uh, who is it? Um, Alice McIntyre wrote a very short article about the seduction of sameness. And so I had to be incredibly mindful about how I was so relating to these participants. Yet at the same time, I had to be very clear that that was also happening. So I'm not sure um, that my, I, my positionality absolutely served as a frame for the way in which I ultimately interpreted the data. Um, that I had and um, also was an important part of the way that I structured the conceptual framework. So I'm not sure as a qualitative researcher, I can be objective. I would also argue that I'm not sure that if I were a quantitative um, or scientific researcher that I could necessarily be objective. Um, but that's just a philosophical stance that I, I'm, I'm taking now um, within my work. Wow. Yeah, and I'll, I'll push a little further on that, which is that um, I actually don't believe in objectivity at all. Um, mm -hmm. I believe in the material consequences of people saying that things are objective, mm -hmm. um, but that objectivity and neutrality are actually very dangerous concepts because mm -hmm. everything anywhere has come from somewhere. Like mm -hmm. there are very few things that we just find out there fully formed. Um, and so because it comes from somewhere, it also has mm -hmm people's positionality bound up in that, right? And so this idea, for example, of correct way of, the correct way of talking, right? There's no correct way of talking. There's a particular group in power who talk in a particular way who have been able to impose mm -hmm. the idea that their, their way of talking is correct. And then mm -hmm. over time you get more and more distant from it and then it just becomes, this is the correct way. Mm -hmm. Obscuring the fact that actually, no, it's that the way that these elite white European men talked in 17th century Europe, right? And, and then that becomes the way that we all make meaning, right? And so um, one of my absolute favorite quotes from um, the woman that I referenced earlier, Elizabeth St. Pierre, um, she says, don't forget, uh, she says about qualitative research, don't forget that we've made it all up, mm -hmm. right? Somebody somewhere created it. Over time, we have come to understandings in the field and we have come to agreements right, that there are particular ways of doing things that we have agreed on, right, that there are particular characteristics of good research, um, you know, that it needs to be systematic, that you need to be transparent about what you did, you know, mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, but we can't forget that it always comes from somewhere, right? So as Kelly was saying, even if you look at quantitative research, um, which typically does, you know, try to, try to say that it's neutral and objective, the, there is a researcher who makes particular decisions. They make the decision mm -hmm. to study something. They make the decision to study something using a particular thing. Yeah. Right. And so that measurement apparatus actually co-creates the phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're looking at it. And so you can think about theory in this way too. 
theory can be a measurement apparatus. If you look at something through a particular theory, it's going to mm-hmm. give you a particular interpretation and not and turn you away from another interpretation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't think that like everything's also like nothing, right? Which right. was came out of like the linguistic post-structural term. Like, yes, there is a something, there's a there there, right? Mm-hmm. But it's bound up and socially constructed, right? Nature and culture are entangled and socially. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, if you think about the race scientists from the 19th century, who, when they were asking questions about race, didn't ask, are African-Americans inferior to white people, they asked, why are they? And which completely, so the kinds of questions that uh, um, objective um, scientists were asking were designed to get certain kinds of questions um, answered in certain kinds of ways. So, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. Uh, my, my work was about emotions, uh, which have always been cast aside um, as a, in the rational project of research. Um, and so for me, I took a purposeful stance in all of my research that, you know, I don't think that, uh, like Kate said, is objectivity, objectivity is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, you know, my first semester of graduate students in my theory class that I teach, when I say that on like the second week, they're like, hold on, wait, what? Um, <laughs> very much like what my colleagues are saying. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it is possible. It's only something one can fake, uh, which is dangerous. And I would, I would like to add that one of, I think sometimes um, there is this confusion between objectivity and uh, minimizing bias. And I think that sometimes, I, sometimes people say object, mm-hmm. I mean, no. And I think they're two very different things. I mean, and this is important for the students. I mean, we all have biases. We all have biases from our own positionality, from mm-hmm. our own perspective, our own life history, our education, our place of birth, our, the address where we live in. All of that adds to biases. What we can do to make sure our research is fair and it, re- and it really represents the stories you want to tell is minimize biases. But that idea, that objectivity, that kind of is like, oh, you're going to basically sterilize your research from bias. Like you cannot sterilize it. I mean, no, that you cannot conduct research in a hyperbaric chamber. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, I mean, because that's the whole idea though. Objectivity is like, no, you, when you're trying to like what? Go into a hyperbaric chamber just close the door so that you can depressurize and then you can do the research and it's not gonna happen. Especially in the case of qualitative research, it happens in real life, in real settings with real people. What we have to do is make sure that our personal biases don't get in the way of our interpretation. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the element of subjectivity, it's always gonna be there because uh, as we said in the, first, in the previous class, one of the characteristics of research is the research is at, it's an instrument. If we are an instrument, we are involved. We are part mm-hmm. of this. We are the ones who are thinking the questions. We are the ones who are proposing the framework. We are the ones thinking of the methods. Uh, so it is subjective. What we do is find ways that that subjectivity doesn't get in the way of showing up, that doing a fair representation of our participants and a fair representation of the voices that are involved in our study. But the search for objectivity in, in, of that you know, sanitized, sterile environment where the research findings are going to appear, that mm-hmm. is just, no, that's a pipe dream. And it's important for students to understand, no, that objectivity, no, that goes out the window. Mm-hmm. What we do is we have subjective research and we just put safeguards, ethical safeguards to minimize mm-hmm. biases and to protect the voices of participants, to protect the very positionality of our participants. And that's what mm-hmm. makes our studies more powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the floor is still open and there is a lot, there are a lot of you, so there should be more questions. Don't be shy. And okay. Oh, hold good on, one. hold sorry. on. Hey, so hold on thought. No, um, no, don't worry, don't worry. I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to get going. I'm so sorry. No, 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 don't worry. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much for, for the time you gave us. I mean, I think you gave this, you give this, uh, the students a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate your your time, and, and I understand we're, we're two hours away, we have different time zones. Uh, oh, but thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank Bye-bye. you so much, everybody. Thanks, Kelly. Bye, Gavin. Bye. Okay. All right, Edison. Uh, the, I mean, you, you, you were going to ask a question, so go for it. Yeah. Uh, Raul, in, in, uh, we were talking about don't uh, 
uh, shopping for a theory, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's like a, having a, a specific uh, concept and put the concept uh, and we believe that most of the time that is a conceptual framework, just putting the concept on a piece of paper. But how to tell one story, one story with different concepts that most of the time they play it in a different way. All right, so the question you want to say is, okay, how do, how, how can we use the concepts to tell, to actually help, yeah, so and, help and, us and, tell and, the story? Yeah, and talking one story, because, because we said that the, that theoretical, or that uh, conceptual framework is like a telling, this, telling one story or how to tell the story. We need to identify how to mm -hmm. tell the story through the conceptual framework but how to tell one story with different contexts, with different concepts that most of the time they play it in a different way. Right, I, I'll, I'll take a crack at this and then um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Gavin and Kelly, you can jump in at any time. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think no, because I mean, that's a, no, that's a very good question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a loaded, no, it's a loaded question, it's a, it's a loaded question. Uh, and one of the, th in, in kind of part of the answer to that question begins in understanding the functions of the conceptual framework within the larger study. Uh, that some people have said, and I, I ascribe to that particular slow thought, that the conceptual framework in some cases, it also works, uh, and I recall, because I heard these words, I mean, I, I recall the words of Leora Bressler right here in this one, um, it works as an, an analytical lens. It means the conceptual framework can give me clues about how I can analyze my data. Mm -hmm. That a carefully constructed conceptual framework becomes the backbone to my methodology becomes the backbone to my analysis becomes the backbone to my to my categories so in that sense edison in that sense the conceptual framework as it's articulated with your question and your problem should give you the clues to find that story you want to tell that's why it's crucial to make to to really devote time to building a care i mean to craft the framework because then there are the framework itself is going to give you clues about where this is going next. Sometimes, again, recalling Kelly's idea, very organically, she, and Kelly used the word organic several times in her, or yes. has used the word organic several times in her discussion, that some of these things are kind of like, it's the consequence of, the refle of this reflexivity about the conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that kind of starts, um, kind of starts answering your question. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if at this point Gavin or Kelly want to jump in and add a few more ideas. Well, I just was thinking of um, Ravitch and Riggins' work about conceptual framework, and um, they talk about this idea of the conceptual framework being an argument, also the, an argument that really explains why the, what you're talking about um, um, matters. Um, and I think that that's important. So it's also a way of telling the audience why your story matters as well um so and and what it means so again it's it's a it's a filter for telling the story or or a lens yeah so yeah, people, I mean, yeah that's about yes, kind yeah. of weaving all of it together mm -hmm. so it's important to think that when you are thinking of the entire research endeavor and that again for all the students don't think that these are I mean, just because in a thesis or in an article, we separate them and we have chapter one, introduction and concept framework, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. Uh, that is just an organizational the, a kind of agreement that we've had for centuries and that sometimes that agreement may not work for you. And, but that when you are actually threading your study, all those things are together. I mean, they're, they're together in the same space, in the same world, in the same mm -hmm. kind of multidimensional space, if you want to you visualize, that they're not separate from one another. They're, they actually kind of, there's very, I mean, there is all these connections mm -hmm. between the problem, the purpose, the question, and the conceptual framework, and that kind of, and they go back and forth. It's mm -hmm. just that when we put it in writing, we just put it in writing in different, in different, in kind of we put it in different 
spaces, the different holes. But that just that, I mean, in many ways, the, uh, the proposal, you need to think of the proposal as a visual representation of a visual representation of your ideas. It may not be, and that sometimes that's just one visual representation of your ideas. And that some people might be better while they're writing the, that actually making a, making a, I don't know, maybe maybe making a three-dimensional mm -hmm. graphic where you're going to be connecting things, kind of like those things we used to do in the chemistry class where you're kind of playing with molecules, trying to build molecules. Uh, that sometimes that's what it's going to look like. Uh, but that everything is threaded. And I think I love, I, I love what Gavin was saying about the threading. That's all, wo mm -hmm. it's all woven. Mm -hmm. uh, and the conceptual framework doesn't operate isolated from the rest of the proposal. Mm -hmm. So it's not a standalone unit. It's not a standalone thing mm -hmm. in, in the larger, in the grander scheme of things. It's part, it's part of a large, it's part of them. It's part of a larger something that you, that the students right now, or we as researchers are building that we call the proposal, we call the project, and it all comes together. Mm -hmm. The framework is just one part that helps me make sense of the rest. So as you are writing your proposals, as you're writing your conceptual framework, you're going to realize that all those readings you're going to be finding along the way, you're going to have to go back to the initial idea that you wrote in the problem, and you're going to have to revise it. Because every author, and that's, that's why it's important, and I, I would, now as I'm thinking, I would like to throw a question to Gavin and Kelly, and it's because, I mean, I mean, although I tell the students that there is no such thing as magic numbers in qualitative research, um, I also think that there are sometimes, there is such a thing as too much mm -hmm. that I cannot quantify a magic number. I cannot say three, five, seven concepts, but I do know there is such a thing as too many concepts in one framework. And the question is, when do we know that maybe we, are, we have too many things here? When do you have, when do you get that feeling in your own work that, oh my God, maybe I have too many concepts or I have too many ideas? For me, it's when they don't all weave together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I um, was rereading a piece, probably my first publication that I ever put out. And I was reading and I was like, this entire section right here where I'm pulling on uh, board view does not need to be here. Mm -hmm. Like this was evidence of a, a young scholar throwing every piece of theory that might have anything to do onto the paper because you know this this idea of like the more theory you have on there, the the smarter you sound, the better it is. And mm. That's not true, mm -hmm. right? And so, and I'm probably not alone in having done that. I, I know that I see that <laughs> in my students' work. I know that I see it in articles that are reviewed for my peers now right um and so i think it's common um and i don't as you said there's not a magic number but it's you know when when you're creating something and you're you're weaving something together but there's this loose thread that has nothing to do with anything it does not make connection to any of the data any of the story you're trying to tell it might be really interesting and it might be something you're super passionate about and really interested in cool, that's your next project. Mm -hmm. How can then you bring that in? Maybe look at the same data again from a different perspective. Because I think that might tell a different story that might have a different framework that might be another project altogether. And it might be just as important because as I said earlier, you know, like research like art is not ever done, it's just put down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've been thinking a lot for the past few minutes uh, maybe perhaps 10 minutes or so off of this question a little bit. There's a book called Thinking with Theory uh, by Alicia uh, uh, Youngblood Jackson, which really takes that and uses theory to think about uh, different theories to think about data in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good resource to think about how we might be able to have different frameworks, different theories, different thought processes with the same project, same piece of data. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking that when I get um, uh, enamored with too much theory, though, I end up getting stuck. So I actually can't move forward anymore. I just, I'm stuck and then I don't understand why and I'm completely perplexed. And then it will be a revelation where I'll say, oh, I have too much stuff. Um, and then I'll have to take 
something away um, that, that, that is that loose end that you were talking about, Gavin, that little, little thread that's just so, oh, it feels so good to talk about it at dinner, you know, it's so wonderful. You want to tell your friends, but you have to, you have to set it aside and put it away. But I think that for me, that's always a sign of, I just can't move forward and I just don't understand why. And it's because it's a glut of theory. I've, I've clogged the theory down. I just, <laughs> I get just completely um, overwhelmed. Uh I actually muted myself by accident. You did. <laughs> yeah, I did. And I, okay. But I was just going to add that sometimes that's an important thing that, um, and while it's important, for, again, for students, while it's important to experiment with theory, and it's important to shop with theory, uh, I think you always have to be very careful not to reach the point, as the, as the expression goes, that you just start throwing things to the wall to see what sticks. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's an important thing for your novice researchers. Like sometimes, uh, and I've seen this when I work with, uh, with students that they start kind of going, what if I do this? And, I do, and they kind of kind of just start throwing mm -hmm. or they just, they just heard a theory in a class and they're like, what if I do this? Like, okay, it becomes a point that you have to also slow down. Um, and we lost Gavin for some reason. I think, well, he said he had some, he may have some issues with connectivity uh, from his end. So maybe he'll return. Uh, but that you have to be careful to find that balance between I'm experimenting and I'm just like, um, oh, here's Beth. And I'm just kind of like, oh, I'm just I'm gonna see, see what works. No, we have to be careful also uh, that experimentation is something you have to do with a certain sense of uh, measure. You have to have a sense of, sense of um, reflexivity, if you will. You cannot simply, just because, I mean, sometimes just because you read it somewhere, it works, but not that doesn't work all the time. And that's where I think it's important to always run questions by someone who's more, I mean, someone who's a peer or someone who's a little more knowledgeable than you are, not to be afraid uh, to have peers with whom, like, yeah, listen, I'm, that, I mean, uh, within your field and uh, run a question by them. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you may run, you may fall prey to this trap where, and I've seen this sometimes when I'm with master's students, that they say in a conceptual framework and the conceptual framework has two, like 10 concepts and I'm like, okay, how are you, again, going back to uh, Gavin's thing, how are you weaving that? And I think that idea of the weaving of this tapestry, if mm -hmm. you will. I mean, when, you, when you're weaving something, I love that metaphor of weaving. Uh, when mm -hmm. you're weaving something, I mean, you're trying to, you're trying to make a shape out of that. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, and you cannot go out of it no, because you want, you have a shape in mind. And then you start, you kind of, and all your threading goes in that particular direction. You just bring different threads to create that particular, that particular mm -hmm. end result. So I think uh, as the students are thinking of their, I mean, where they can go with conceptual frameworks, one important lesson is, yes, you can play with this, you can experiment, you can, uh, but always, be, always being careful not to go into extremes. But at the same time, be careful that I don't think you can have just one concept and say in color a conceptual framework. Because sometimes that happens too. I think it's just one concept and they want to build a whole framework with that. Mm -hmm. Because, no, because in that sense, no, because it's called a framework because you are framing ideas together. So there should be a no one, no single theory uh, is all inclusive. And that's important for students that sometimes students can, they read one author and they think that that one author is, well, and you can, it can happen. But if you're going to go with one author, then what you have to be extra careful is you're going to have to read a lot of the work from and about that author. Mm -hmm. Because that's the part where it gets complicated. I don't know. What, I don't know, Honestly, I don't know what's more complicated. If building a framework with multiple authors or trying to build a framework with just one author where you're going to have to read everything that has been said and done. <laughs> I would venture to say that the one author would be limiting. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I have a, a philosophy, uh, my writing partner, Travis and I, and Travis actually introduced this to me about uh, kind of this notion of burn your idols. Um, and so uh, there's a, a quote, you know, anyway, uh, but, but basically at the end of the day, if you build all of your entire legacy on the work of one person and that person ends up being complete garbage, 
um, then you built all of your work on that and you might not want to be associated with that anymore, right? Um, and so I think it's important to not only uh, be ideologically diversified in terms of our approaches and our framework, but also know that, you know, like, you know, like I'm a Foucauldian, I, I, I do a lot of uh, stuff with Foucault, but that's not all I know. Um, and if I were to only approach everything with that, it, it becomes a hammer in search of a nail when we might need a screwdriver. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need to be well read um, and know that sometimes, you know, like I'm not going to mess with Foucault right now. I'm going to go and, and talk about um, another frame or another scholar, or I'm going to have Foucault in the intersection of uh, Bala or someone else, you know? So who can I engage with that is going to help me to frame my understanding and my analysis of the question and the experience under uh, the All right, we have, one, we have another question here. Manuela, uh, go for it. All right, so uh, going back to having too many concepts, I have this question, like after you narrow down all the concepts you want to use in, in your research, how do you organize them? How do you connect one and another? Like, I know they connect through the research, but how can I know this one goes first and that one is connected to this one and then this other one? Hmm. Oh, I'm sitting this one out. <laughs> well, I, I think that it depends on the conceptual framework, um, each conceptual framework. So the one that um, you read about that I wrote, uh, that I created, um, I think for me, it was, I, and I'm not saying trial and error, but it felt very much like a puzzle. So I had to, I had all of these pieces and I had to figure out all of these different ways to move them around. And I also realized that they were interconnected too. So um, that they were, they were actually almost impossible to untangle in a sense. So, um, so I think that I approached it that way, that, that, that it was this um, holistic process and I had to figure it, that it already was there um, and that I had just to find a way to um, move the pieces around to uncover it. Yeah, I agree with Kelly. I would also say that it, it, it depends not only on the conceptual framework, but upon the scholar and what mm -hmm. makes sense for you. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, sometimes writing is not writing. Sometimes mm -hmm. writing is going for a walk. Sometimes writing is going to a happy hour with some of your colleagues. Sometimes it's talking. Sometimes it's thinking out loud. Sometimes it's drawing. Yeah. Uh, and so how are you making these connections? For me, sometimes like I will just take out a blank piece of paper and I'll write some words and it might mean nothing to someone else, but it's how I can figure out how different things connect. Mm -hmm. And it might be a mashup of um, terms and jargon from theory or research or some of the language of my co-researchers or participants. Um, and that helps me to conceptually map out. Mm -hmm. Uh, my way forward. Oh. Yeah, and I want to concur with that. I actually, the, draw, the drawing it out, like creating a visual image of it is so helpful. Um, and the framework that you saw, which is was modified, the, the, the version that you saw has really changed a lot. But I remember going into a coffee shop and drawing it out for the first, first time. Um, and that was where I knew that I had something in that moment. So yeah, absolutely. I've forgotten that. Yeah, let me just, I want to I pick up from all these ideas because I mean, uh, in this, because in Manuela's question, she was kind of like, uh, how do you organize them? And that you have to be careful with this idea of organizing them because mm -hmm. sometimes there are moments where a conceptual framework is hierarchical. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's hierarchical. Sometimes you end up with a pyramid of mm -hmm. where there's a concept that kind of drives, is kind of the top and drives the others. And then there comes moments where the framework becomes this moving thing. Mm -hmm. Like some of the frameworks I, I mean, from you know, my research and with my research teams, uh, they're, they're these amorphic structures mm -hmm. where I can see dots that are concepts that are kind of connected and then they start creating in my, again, I visualize it in my mind as 
I put him in a PowerPoint presentation as a two-dimensional figure, but I know when I'm operating as, for analysis, they're three-dimensional figures in kind of like in hyperspace, if you will, mm -hmm, if you, mm -hmm. you kind of like, and that sometimes the way I present them, I can put them in a particular order when I write the conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, unless you make it so, it doesn't mean the order is hierarchical. Sometimes I just can put them in alphabetical order. Or sometimes I can put them kind of like in an order that goes from closest to the question to furthest to the question. And then, but the framework kind of brings them all together. Mm -hmm. um, and those are decisions that you, the, the, the young scholars, are going to have to make as you're proposing the framework. And what's more important is not, it's both the choices you make and how you justify them. Because uh, there is always going to be a question, and I'm sure that Gavin and Kelly have gotten this question. Sometimes when you present something at a conference. Uh, so you use this concept. Why did you use this one? Mm -hmm. That we get that question all the time. Like, why did you use that? But what if and someone is when the question, the person who's asking the question is a scholar on why. So why did you use X when you could have used Y? And it's a mm -hmm. Y scholar asking the question. So I, and I think the key in that moment is being having a good grasp of the concept you read so you can justify that inclusion. Because in many fields, in literacy studies, you're going to find concepts that are very similar to one another. Uh, and that are just, there are different authors that um, they kind of support the concept. But when you go to the bottom of that, sometimes the concepts are not that different. They just kind of like, they just have some, ver some slight variations or some slight differences in interpretation from one scholar to the next. So it's important also, while it's, while it's okay, while you shouldn't be stubborn in your decisions, you should also know that there is a moment that you need to stand your ground. And if you chose three or four ideas and two or three authors, and those are going to be, that's going to be your team. That's going to be the team that's going to help you uh, get to the finish line. Stand your, in, in those are the choices. Stand your ground if you have a good argument. Uh, now, and, not, and, and then choose carefully whose voices you're going to listen to in order to make changes because everybody will give you ideas, but if you start listening to everybody, if we start listening to everybody, we're gonna, I mean, we're gonna drive ourselves insane. So there comes a point that that's where you should find people you trust, could be classmates, could be colleagues, uh, find yourself good mentors. And it's important to, and it's at this point, it's important to have good mentors, uh, people you can confide in and ask questions about, is this the right way to go? Is this not the right way to go? Uh, because you don't, I mean, sometimes you go to a conference and people ask you that question and then you go home and you're like, oh my God, did I do the right, did I make the right choice? And then you can spend hours, sometimes on the flight back. I mean, you're going to be on the, on the plane thinking for, th for four hours, did I make the right choice? And, that, and that's, no, don't torture yourself because I mean, when you're on a four hours on a plane, just watch, just watch the in-flight entertainment if, if you have it because that is not the time to start thinking about the conceptual framework. Just yeah. relax and go home. <laughs> relax and get home and see your family. But I think it's important to bring up those issues that sometimes a framework can be hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what you're going to do is list the concepts and then show me how they operate. Mm -hmm. And that how they operate, it really, that is the conceptual framework. It's not the list of concepts. It's how you weave them how you put them together, how you're going to show me how they operate in practice in order to make the framework function. And I think that's the important element, um, just to kind of wrap up Manuela's very good question. Mm -hmm. It's, you are, I mean, it's an important element that you are the one who has to make your own choices that even, even if you have a thesis director or a thesis advisor, uh, our role as advisors is to help you mold that into something presentable, not necessarily to impose our views of the universe on you. You have to come with choices and all eight of you will have to make choices about your research. You're gonna have to make choices about what it is that I want to do what it is that I want out of this project.
Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do in the case of the research methods class is to read the framework and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. Or I don't know if you have something going on. You might, and I can give suggestions or, but oh, that's what, pretty much what I'm going to be doing when I read your frameworks is, does this look like a framework? It's like kind of like, uh, yeah, like in the question you, uh, students can ask is how do how do you know it's a framework? Is one of those things. Uh, I mean, I know it when I see it. It's mm -hmm. kind of like the the famous case of the Supreme Court justice on obscenity. I mean, you know it when you see it. Like, you know it when you see it. It's kind of like that. I mean, like I can tell you. I mean, I cannot give you a concrete answer. Or like I have this checklist. No, it's kind of like I know when I see it because I can see that the problem becomes better articulated once the framework is there. Um, Zadie has a question. Zadie, ask away. Hold on, did I? Hello, hello everybody. First of all, I am going to appreciate all your words and your knowledge because all of your thing and what all you say is very useful to make our researches. And then my question is related to what uh, Raul says, is about the number of concepts. Uh, when I have, or when could I suppose that maybe it's important to delete a concept because I had a lot of concepts, or how this concept, I'm going to <laughs> reorganize my questions. For example, when I have a lot of co word concepts, for my framework. And I realized that one of those concepts is not working too much inside my project. Could I uh, delete this concept or I have to include it? Um, if it doesn't work, I, I don't think that you need to ha include it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Less is more to the famous poem. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. You may use it. <laughs> yeah. No, and yeah, and, and I'll follow up on the, yeah, it's, you are the one in the end, again, and this is in, the very important part, especially for, uh, for the younger scholars um, in the class and the younger scholars who are listening to this webinar. You, in the end, you are the person who's making the decisions. The role of people who are going to advise you is to give you a sense of that's a good decision, go for it, or okay, that's not a good decision. Let's re let's sit down and think this through. And that's pretty much what I mean. What you're going to do as an advisor? I mean, like you can say, oh, go for it. That's that's this is brilliant. That's genius. Or okay, hold on. Let's have let's order another coffee and let's have a conversation about this. Mm -hmm. And Either of those choices, I mean, those things, I mean, and whatever's going to happen with your framework is going to be somewhere in between those two. It's going to be part of that continuum. But what's important is you, as the person who's thinking the project, you are the person making the choices. Mm -hmm. And you should, um, you should be ready to make those choices. And it's very important when you, when, and at that point when you're gonna be meeting your thesis director, and in the case of the students here, it will be next year when we assign directors after they take their research courses. They'll start in January, 2021, they'll have thesis directors. Mm -hmm. You're gonna come with something and your director is gonna look at that and give you some ideas. And then you can, you negotiate. But always, but, and one important element of putting together frameworks is don't get overly attached to mm -hmm. the ideas in the frameworks because some of those things change and the frameworks grow and sometimes they grow it's sometimes they grow in in the less is more they become addition by subtraction mm -hmm. and sometimes a framework is just sometimes it's addition by subtraction like uh i don't need a concept anymore a concept that could have been near and dear at point x when your project evolves that concept as much as you enjoy it it might disappear and recall my dissertation uh i have like 12 pages of theory of um, discussion of the Bourdieu framework, all these ideas about Bourdieu. And that thing kept popping in and out from my dissertation. Like one draft, it came in, the next draft, it came out, another, uh, okay, and, and it, at the end, it, was, it stayed out, but it came in and out like about 10 times. 
in every revision and every iteration, and at the end it wasn't there, and it was okay. But because sometimes you have to like, okay, you have to reinsert it to the framework to see if it works, and then you pull it out again, and then you bring another concept, and there's gonna be a lot of move, a lot of mixing and remixing and mashing in that process, uh, especially all of you who are just getting introduced to theory. Mm -hmm. All of the students are going to be just, they're just, this is their very, for many of them, this is going to be their first serious formal approximation to theorizing and conceptualizing. Uh, there is going to be a lot of experimentation. And that's perfectly okay. Uh, from the perspective of the course, I don't I expect you to submit at the end of the course something that resembles a very sketchy conceptual framework. I mean, something that I can see, well, this with six more months of reading is going to be a conceptual framework. I'm not expecting that by the end, by April, by the end of May, oh, I'm going to have a fully, no, 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 you're not going to have a fully developed conceptual framework by May. Because May is just one month away. It's not going to happen. You're going to have some very primitive early ideas that you're going to play with for the next four months until we meet again in research two. That's what you're going to have, and that's perfectly okay, because that's how it starts. A lot of frameworks, and I think both Gavin and Kelly said it, sometimes a lot of frameworks begin by taking a walk. Mm -hmm. A lot of frameworks come to you when you're taking a shower. A lot of frameworks come to you when you're drinking coffee, you have your notebook, and that's why the journal is so important. And then you start just drawing things, and you start drawing things on a piece of paper. And as you draw those things on a piece of paper, they become a potential framework that you're going to experiment. And I see it at all levels. I mean, I see it with the undergrad students, with the master's students, with the doctoral students. Uh, building a conceptual framework above everything, it's an exercise in experimentation. It is an exercise in taking risks, an exercise in taking chances, an exercise in moving things around. There's gonna be a lot of motion, a lot of flux especially at the beginning. I, and I, I think uh, Gavin and Kelly can agree that at the very beginning, when you're putting together a framework, there is a lot of, a lot of movement and a lot of ideas are coming in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, any, are there any other questions? Uh, and yeah, I have some, and Sarah, you said you have a question, so go ahead. Okay, good evening. Um, my question is, this is not about conceptual framework, but I would like to know your opinion about this other aspect. And it is from your point of view, what are the best tools you can use to collect data in a qualitative research? That's my question, thank you. Mm -hmm. By tools, do you mean methods? Yes, that's yeah. what I mean. Okay, okay. Well, um, I guess what I would say, in my opinion, it depends on the question, um, that your research question that you have, what the best tools would be. Um, and again, Katie's not here, but also what your purpose is as well. Those, that those would help you make the decision about what methods would be best used. Something that came out of my, um, one of my early research classes as a student was um, thinking through all of your available senses. Um, and so often in qualitative research, we're paying attention to the words, mm -hmm. um, which would be a, an oral, oral element. But I, I've become more interested in kind of like the feeling of the room and mm -hmm. the feeling between people. And that's not something you can hear, but you can feel it. Or what do you see? Um, you know, like there's lots of different things to think about when you're collecting data. Um, and, and taking notes on what you're doing. Um, so I think 
yes, pay attention to what people are saying, but also don't forget to watch for things that are unsaid. Mm -hmm. You're muted. Uh, again, I did. I keep doing that. <laughs> uh, and once again, um, a lot of these decisions, and probably part of the answer to your question, and I'm foreshadowing tomorrow's webinar, sometimes the answer to the question is not going to appear when you're putting the conceptual framework together. Sometimes mm -hmm. that answer comes when you're doing the lit review. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the lit review is the one, is the one that helps you piece some of those, uh, put some of those pieces together. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm going to say. That's what I'm going to say about that because tomorrow we're going to spend mm -hmm. the webinar talking about lit review. And you see that a lot of questions that you start in terms of how the methodology is going to shape up. The lit review sometimes gives you all the, could be, it already gives you the clues. It already have, you just have to put the puzzle together. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but it goes back into what you want to do. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important, Sarah. It's very important to have a very clear purpose for your study. And a solid question, because when you have a, a good purpose and a solid question, that kind of begins, the question itself begins to foreshadow the methodology, mm -hmm. begins to foreshadow the methods, begins to foreshadow what I'm going to do in terms of the fieldwork. Mm -hmm. uh, it's never, and again, I, I like the question because it's mm -hmm. never too early to start thinking about it. I mean, yes, in terms of the curricular structure, that is the subject of research too, but the reality of research is no, you don't you don't think about methodology one day uh, on Monday because of, because today is Friday and I'm thinking about the conceptual framework. No, uh, for the research project, every day is Friday, every day is Monday, every day is Tuesday. It means at any given time, you're thinking about any given thing, of any given element of your research. Uh, I'm going to stop here for a moment because um, somebody left a question in the comments of the uh, of the YouTube chat. It's actually one of my one of my actually one of my grad students, and I'm going to read the question textually as she wrote it. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you please give me more insight into how we can identify and approach the epistemological issues of the conceptual framework? Thank you in advance. Hmm. Um, I hope I'm answering correctly because epistemological issues can mean a lot. Um, uh, so I hope I'm getting your question correct. But for me, um, they're all they're all <laughs> going to say woven together, and I hate that I keep using that <laughs> verb tonight. Uh, but they're not, you know. Uh, my onto epistemological commitments lead me to my framework um, and so uh, much like Kate was saying at the beginning about purpose right like my epistemology is tied in with my purpose of doing what I do and so um, they lead me in many regards to my um, frames of analysis um, and then that ties back into the question earlier about uh, objectivity and subjectivity um, because for me like as it is a commitment to doing what I hope is good in the world like that's obviously a subjective statement and therefore my frames are subjective but I'm owning that um, and, I, and I state that in my work that my work and my writing and my research is all activist oriented and there's no escaping that for me. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess I just see the epistemology, your epistemolo epistemological choices that are so connected to the question that you're answering, trying to answer again to your purpose, that really that is an, um, that's embedded in your conceptual framework. That's part of your conceptual framework because your methodology is also part of your conceptual framework. So um, uh, I think it feeds it and it's part of it at the same time. And, I wanted and, to say woven, but I held back. Yeah. <laughs> no. 
and and it goes, but it, I mean, it even goes um, just to add my part of the answer to the question. It goes even goes further back mm -hmm. to the reason why we're doing quality. I mean, why this this study yeah. you want to was a qualitative study in the first place. And as as uh, Gavin and Kelly were discuss, thinking, were answering, I my mind wandered back to a conversation I had a couple of years ago with uh, Judith Green. We had a, a very nice Zoom conversation, and she kept she kept going into an argument that. You have to be careful not to treat, in the case of, she was talking about ethnography in particular, but not to treat it just as a method, but, uh, that, but as an epistemology. And that applies to qualitative inquiry. You cannot treat qualitative inquiry as a method. Mm -hmm. No, there is a part of qualitative inquiry that becomes the method, but qualitative inquiry is an epistemology. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a series of epistemological choices about how I want to study a social phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So, as you as you think about this, the qualitative inquiry itself is epistemology. That means that that is going to gear, that's going to help you guide those decisions you make about what elements, on what theories and what ideas and what authors are going to come together to build the conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. So it I can, it kind of goes into this idea that within that larger umbrella that we call qualitative inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, whichever stance you take, and you can call it critical, or you can call it critical feminism, or you can call it post-humanist, or you can mm -hmm. call it uh, post-structural, I mean, however you want to name it. The moment you name it, you go into that one, one particular stance, mm -hmm. that is already an epistemolog epistemological choice. Mm -hmm. When I say my work is informing social critical theory, that is an epistemological choice that makes everything move into that direction. So it means that my choices of authors, my choices of theories, my choices of uh, concepts cannot contradict the larger stance that I already put, that I already assumed in my work. Mm -hmm. So even in that sense, to answer the question, it's the choices I make from the moment I frame my research, even from the moment I situate my, re my topics and my research agenda, those choices are first and foremost purely epistemological mm -hmm. and everything else i do in my work is going to have kind of kind of start falling into place mm -hmm. in that sense that i cannot choose authors that look at this from a post from a positivist view because if i'm doing critical statement that's not that's contradictory mm -hmm. and there are certain contradictions that you can say i can navigate when i'm building a conceptual framework but there are some contradictions that are you cannot reconcile because mm -hmm. they're not meant to be reconciled in the first place. So that kind of, it kind of goes into that. Your epistemological choices go, I mean, they start from the moment I said, oh, I want to do a qualitative study. Your epistemological choices begin from the moment I say, oh, I want to do a case study, or I want to do action research, or I want to do an ethnography, or I want to do phenomenology. From that moment, everything, I mean, that is the, that is the, the, the first beacon that is going to guide all the, um, all those epistemological choices. And mm -hmm. I stop here because Manuela has another question. So go for it, Manuela. All right. So uh, taking into account, like, all, all the concepts that you uh, might choose, there are some concepts that can be really broad, right? So would it be wrong if, for example, I just choose one specific informa information, uh, one specific part of a concept? Would it be correct just to use that little part for my own research? I think that's what Katie, Kate was talking about earlier uh, uh, in terms of uh, with Ryzen Maddox and uh, the Louis and Guattari's notion of using theory like television. Um, mm -hmm. pick and choose what works for you. Now, mm -hmm. not everyone is going to say that's cool or okay, um, but, you know, I think it works. Um, mm -hmm. There are things that you aren't going to jive with. There are some mm -hmm. scholars that I vehemently do not agree with some of what they say or do uh, or theorize, but other elements, I'm like, yeah, like, that totally makes sense, and I will use that. Mm -hmm. um, because at, at some point, like, what are you gonna, where are you gonna stop? You know, if, you, if you're using 
you know, wiser framework of wada wada wada. Like, are you going to use my entire uh, opus? Are you going to talk about everything I've ever written? No, like, so where, where's the line between like only what I say in the first half of this paper, not the second half versus like everything mm -hmm. I've ever written. Um, so take what's useful um, for what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I, I just will agree with, you about that. That's I was going to mention, Katie. Take what you need. Because when you at this particular stage, and it's important to situate uh, where the students, where the students are right now, students. So you're like at the master's level. The objective of the objective here is that you can show that you have a baseline comprehension of what a conceptual framework is and how it operates in terms of the research. It's not necessarily to build uh, an, a super convoluted framework. I mean, sometimes that is the object of a dissertation, not necessarily in a master's thesis. Uh, something, and sometimes it's better to choose to start working with a smaller amount number, number of concepts that gradually you're going to go deeper and deeper in the reading of those concepts. Mm -hmm. Because there are concepts that when you even, and I'm thinking about in terms of literacy theory, that sometimes, uh, some of, my, some of my students propose, oh, I want to do critical literacy. Like, okay, we need to start narrowing that, that narrowing that down a little bit more because critical literacy alone, it's a really big and nebulous concept. So you need to kind of like, okay, bring me a context where you want to start operating that and then read everything you can find on about that particular point of that particular school of thought. Because you cannot, as, as Gavin says, you cannot cover everything. You cannot cover everybody. And sometimes not even when you're doing the dissertation, do you have the time to read everything that has been said and done about a subject. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you have to realize, okay, I have to stop. At some point, you have to make the choice. Okay, I have to stop and I have to start writing. And mm -hmm. I have to stop reading. And I have to stop journal. I have to start. Now I need to sit down and start building the framework. Mm -hmm. So, but, and understand that the goal is to show that you have a, a broad enough comprehension of the concepts that guide your framework mm -hmm. and that you're not simply, oh, I just found one article uh, and that's what I'm going to use. Like, okay, that's a little, I don't think you're going to get a grasp of a concept just by reading one article or just by reading one book because that's the other thing. Then as you, go, you start going deeper into that rabbit hole, you're gonna have to start adding more reading into that mix. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes when you're building frameworks, especially at the beginning, it's okay to be conservative and go for that less is more approach. Go for a framework that you can manage. Again, remember what we said in the last class about building a plane you can fly and land. Mm -hmm. uh, so build a plane you can fly. And sometimes building up, I mean, you don't need I mean, 10 or 12 concepts, you just need two or three or four that can help you move this thing forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key, that's the key to all this. Uh, we still have a little time. Does, are, are any, I mean, any other questions? I see a lot of you have been very quiet and that's fine, but if you still have questions, this is a good time to ask. Take advantage of uh, our guests' presence here and throw questions their way. So any, um, any, any other questions here? Yes, I, I would like to ask something. Oh, go for it. Okay. Um, well, talking about the, the framework, uh, I don't know if it's a matter of style, but it, do you know that it's okay like to have an introduction and a conclusion like to make the, the, the concepts flow? And yeah, like to have an introduction, a conclusion, or only like a start like uh, with the with the concepts, and then you explain why did you choose them, or how are are they important in your research? I think that it's useful to have an introduction and a conclusion when you're outlining your conceptual framework. Um, I don't know how um, your um, studies are being presented. Um, 
uh, whether they're presented in chapters, um, like in a dissertation. Um, but I know that when I wrote my dissertation, I did have a whole chapter describing my um, framework and it did have an introduction and a conclusion. Uh, yeah, I mean, for the purpose of this particular uh, exercise, yeah, that's exactly the way yeah. they'll have it. So yeah. it'll be, it's, it'll be, I mean, it's a thesis, it's MA thesis format, so. Yeah, so yeah, it's totally appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And it's important, because sometimes it's important to give a little bit of context of why you got here. And then the conclusion, if you want to have a conclusion could be, because I mean, one way to do it is you can start kind of listing the concepts, kind of bring me through, I mean, take you through the journey. Okay, like briefly mm -hmm. define mm -hmm. the concepts that are going to be part of your framework mm -hmm. and then bring, introduce the concept that you're proposing. Mm -hmm. Because the idea of the conceptual framework is, Propose a concept, even if it's a very simple concept that brings those two or three or four ideas together, because otherwise you're just enumerating theories. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, what are you going to do about it in relation to your question? Mm -hmm. So that so the con there has to be a point, and sometimes conceptual frameworks fail because they're not bringing it home. They fail to bring it home. So you introduce me to the concepts, and then if sometimes I, I, it's happened that you read and you left it a cliffhanger and you're like, okay, you introduce these four concepts and you leave me hanging, you leave me in a cliffhanger. And I'm like, okay, what's the conceptual framework? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's important. Bring it home. So introduce a concept even and come up with a new, I mean, yeah, come up with a new, a new, a new phrase that can describe it. I mean, mm -hmm. can you do that? Of course you can. It's, it's your right. It's, it's your scholarly right. If you, Think that you have a new term, you can introduce it in your thesis. I mean, uh, just because it's a master thesis doesn't mean you, can, you cannot do it. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you have something and you realize that you you got a, you may have hit jackpot, introduce the concept. If somebody else is using it, fine. Then you just give it give it your own twist. I mean, that doesn't that's not a problem. I mean, for example, in language studies, there's a concept called translanguaging, and there are I can I can enumerate like maybe about. I don't even know how many definitions there are. Mm -hmm. I think there are as many definitions as scholars tackling it. And everybody <laughs> has a, you know, and what you do is when you look at a framework is, okay, look, let's look at what these, all these people have said, and I'm going to come up with another idea. I'm, I'm going to contribute another definition to the debate mm -hmm. because that's what we do. But uh, I don't think there is one single concept with very few exceptions that has only one author that has actually defined it in its entirety. I mean, it's very, there's a very rare situation, especially in social sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, any, do we have more questions from the crowd? Um, I don't see any hands raised here. Yeah, I would like to make another question. Oh, go for it. All right. Uh, when, when you are going to talk about your concepts, of course, you need to add some definitions there, like, like you already said, they are broad kind of definitions, but how do we know which ones will be valid for our conceptual uh, references or framework? Do you know what I mean? Um, well, again, I think it has to do with, um, are these concepts are going to help you um, meet your purpose or meet the goal of your study? Um, so I think that that's the first thing you need to ask yourself. Does this serve my purpose? Does this answer my question? And sometimes, Manuela, you're not going to know that until you start writing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, there are things that you can, there are some things that you can think a priori when it comes to your research. The framework, you can think a little bit about it and you can say, maybe this concept is going to work. But only until you start putting the concepts together to operate in whatever configuration you have, whether you decide to kind of put them in your mind as a, as a geometric shape, or as a geometric ball, I mean, three-dimensional shape, or or as a graphic, or as a graphic organizer, or wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, wait. I think I think you didn't understand my question. Sorry. I, I'm gonna try to make it a little bit more clear. Okay. Like, I know it. about the the concepts we need to add, but 
uh, let's say, for example, in my research, uh, I want to talk about 21st century skills, and that is going to be one of the concepts, right? Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. I need to add that a, a definition for 21st century skills. Correct. How do I know that that definition is good, it is valid for the research? Uh, I think the answer would stand the same. I mean, you're not going to know until you until you put it there and you play it out in relation to your entire proposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're never going to know if a, if a definition really works beforehand. I mean, right. you, can, you have to kind of you have to kind of like put it inserted into the proposal and let it play. Mm -hmm. And okay. as and if that if you can see, for example, that that definition helps you move the framework and at some point get into the methodology, then it works. But if that definition, that idea is not, it's actually, in, maybe it's just interrupting the flow or stopping you from getting mm -hmm. into the methodological choices, then that definition is not gonna work. Okay. There are a lot of things that when it comes to putting the framework that you cannot project. You just have to test them out. Mm -hmm. And as you test them out, they work. Okay. And you can continue expanding it, or then you realize that it doesn't work, and you have to just remove it. But some of the things, okay. some of the things you just cannot, you cannot think about it before. I mean, before the fact. Some of those things are after the fact, and that's an important consideration. The definition could, if 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 you found it, you have to test it out in relation to the entire uh, proposal, and then the proposal itself. So the proposal has organic ways to tell you that definition works or the definition doesn't work. Mm -hmm. One of the ways is, can I, can I keep moving forward? Even if, even if the writing is interrupted by the presence of that framework, then you know that the, that concept is not going to work and you have to find something else. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, since it's 9, 10, I'm going to see, are there, are, are there any final questions um, from anybody? Oh. Anna, yeah, go for it. Oh, I think this is, this is not uh, the answer that Manuela expect to, to hear, I think. <laughs> because I think the question is another one. I think, okay. I think the question is, um, or maybe what is the correct resource where I can get the definition of the, of the concept? Maybe, maybe it's that Manuela is gonna, is Manuela asked, what is valid uh, where I can get the concept? From a thesis, from a master thesis, from okay. A oh, that's that's a whole different. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in that that's what I was trying answer, to ask. <laughs> no, and I think no. The Sudano, the two, but the, but the question Manuela was started asking, and this question are, I mean, they're complementary. They're not necessarily contradictory. Uh, and the question, okay. and the answer of where you're gonna find it, it's it's gonna be the result of all all, all of your inquiries. So. Sometimes uh, previous theses and dissertations can give you can give you clues. The literature review, some the, it helps you, and the, the review and the conceptual framework are, are very connected. They're what, no, no matter what, which one you put first, they're both connected, and they both help each other make sense of the entire fraud, the entire proposal. Yeah. So whatever I mean, the answer is wherever wherever you can find inspiration from it's valid there is no source that is that is inappropriate uh, as you're beginning to profile your project any source you find any reading you can get your hands on it's a very good starting point mm -hmm. okay thank you well uh so if there are and I'll just give one minute for people, uh, for folks, if they have one final question for, for the conversation. Manuela. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My last question will be, uh, how important it is to have a concept 
that relates to the context you are going to use in your research. Like for example, I'm going to work with teenagers. Uh, should I have a concept related to that on the framework? Um, it, you might want to have, I, I don't know what your question is, but um, you might want to have um, some theory about adolescent development. That would be possible if that aligned with your question. I mean, um, I know that when Kate, Katie was talking about a missing piece um, in her study where she was talking about doing something on learning theory, and she was on learning, teacher learning, and she had nothing about learning theory. And that was what made me think of that. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And to follow up on that, yes. I mean, you really want to make sure there is a sense of coherence and congruence mm -hmm. between the question you want to ask and the, and the concepts that are going to come in for. Yeah. I mean, you can think divergently, absolutely, but there needs to be a sense of continu I mean, a sense of coherence and congruence. Mm -hmm. if the concepts you bring in are. No, I mean, they can be divergent, but they can help you move the question forward. And, but there are concepts that sometimes don't necessarily help you move the question. So there is no point in bringing them into the equation as much as, as, it, as much okay. as it makes So the question, I mean, the, there is a relationship between the problem, the question, and the framework. They all, they all start kind of, they all play together. There is a sense of a dance. There is a very performative sense in the, in the construction of this. Mm -hmm. They all have to kind of fit, they have to fit in together somehow. And then somehow it's going to happen as you're writing, as you're writing your ideas, as you're putting your ideas on paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So just to, um, to end today's webinar, I, I always, and whenever I have guests, I always like to basically throw in the same question. Um, and as I've said, all the students here are very, I mean, they're all beginning their journeys uh, as researchers. They're all beginning their journeys into developing research projects. And I always like to uh, make sure that we can have on record some advice, some down to earth practical advice that you can provide to this um, incredible group of, because they're an incredible group of learners. Mm -hmm group of young scholars they're still they're they're starting but one or two pieces of down-to-earth advice that you can provide to this group um okay um don't be afraid to take risks i think i heard you say that a lot um tonight uh don't be afraid to make mistakes um don't be afraid to um find yourself that you've hit a brick wall and back up and start again um, uh, and understand it's not going to be linear, um, but uh, it, it's, it's going to be worth it because all of these different directions are going to um, teach you something about how to answer your research question. I think for me, my biggest piece of advice would be try to have fun. Um, <laughs> that seems silly, I think. And, and I probably would have been really angry at someone who said that to me when I was writing my dissertation. Um, but it was fun in a mm -hmm. weird way. Um, mm -hmm. The learning process uh, of going through and trying something. And so yeah, there's going to be days where you're not going to want to do it. Uh, but try to make sure that you do something that is fun, that you're enjoying. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, like I ended up doing arts informed research for my dissertation because that was fun. And mm -hmm. I like creating things. And so that was a way for me to still infuse mm -hmm. fun into what I do. Mm -hmm. And it's become kind of my now trajectory. And so if you're able to like infuse fun into what you're doing, that might open up new avenues. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, uh, I think as this conversation is evident, there's a community of people out there. Uh, mm -hmm rely on that community. Um, I've never met any of the three of these other folks that I've been talking mm -hmm. to this evening or any of you for that matter. Uh, mm -hmm. But maybe I will share an airplane with them one day where someone has smacked me down for not using 
Siri X and using Y and mm -hmm. uh, Raul or Kelly or Kate can talk me down and real and help me realize that using Y was just perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we are living in an ever evolving interconnected world. And so mm -hmm. have fun and, and rely on one another. Mm -hmm. I, and that I'm not going to add any further because I think um, Kelly's and Gavin's advice is sound. And mm -hmm. I think we all, all of us, beginning or advanced researchers, need to keep those reminders mm -hmm. in our mind. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to end the, uh, the class and the webinar right here mm -hmm. uh, because it's 920. And in the case of the students, they have been basically glued to the computers for the past five hours mm -hmm. and i think they deserve a break um i'll take a moment to express my gratitude my appreciation um to three scholars that now are three friends mm -hmm. uh, we just met a few days ago in the case of kelly and gavin i i have a few conversations with katie before but now it's like they're not just we're not just scholars and friends mm -hmm. um with whom i I'm sharing this journey of qualitative inquiry. So from that, uh, from that perspective, I want to thank you and express my heartfelt appreciation for the time that you gave us, for the wisdom that you shared. Uh, and I'm very sure there are lots of ideas. And right now, there are lots of ideas to process. And mm -hmm. I probably, have, what I suggest to students is let this sink in and next week when you're going back to work on your proposals go back to the webinar it's going to be recorded on the youtube channel i'll send mm -hmm. you the link um go back to that digest the ideas once again mm -hmm. um there is a lot of information here that you need time to process um, there is a lot of information here that i need time to process mm -hmm. because there are so many good ideas that came out of this conversation that i need to go back and think and reflect uh, and engage in conversation with Paulina and engage in conversation with Paulina while we're playing with the dogs uh, because that's what doing research is, is thinking and percolating and moving things back and forth. So my gratitude to the two of you, my appreciation to all the students uh, for their attention, for their commitment, for the questions, the very powerful, incredibly smart and brilliant questions you brought because there were those questions were very good questions that made us think. And that's important. It is important in a situation like this, when you have such good questions as these, that enriches the conversation. So I invite, I invite you, my, my dear students, to continue pushing the boundaries and continue pushing the envelope with the questions. Because that's what doing research is, is pushing the envelope, not being afraid to ask the tough questions, not being afraid to ask burning questions. Uh, throw hard questions at the scholars because it is our duty to answer them. Mm -hmm. That's our duty. That's what we were trained for, to answer the tough questions that anybody can throw in our direction. So with mm -hmm. that, thank you. Uh, everyone, um, as a reminder for people who are watching the stream, uh, tomorrow we'll have the second part um, of this uh, open lecture weekend. Uh, tomorrow, we have three other wonderful guests who are going to come and talk to us about literature reviews. Uh, you're welcome to join us once again through the YouTube channel. Um, we'll be sharing on social media the link. But if you're already following the channel on YouTube, uh, we'll be here at 11 a.m. Colombian time, which is 11 a.m. Central time for the uh, next open lecture. So with that, thank you all. Uh, once again, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Gavin. Um, beautiful conversation we had tonight. Thank you, Edison and Zadie, for the support and the questions, the participation. Thank you to the students. And we'll reconvene again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>